Well, good evening, everyone, brothers and sisters, young people. Welcome to our Wednesday night class and the consideration of Isaiah. And this will be the fifth and last study on Isaiah to the subject, the Council of the Prophet. So we'll commence this evening with hymn 378, followed by prayer. O Yahweh, our loving Heavenly Father, the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, we thank thee that thou hast called us out a people for thy name, even to be heirs according to the promises in filling this earth with thy glory. It is truly a privileged position to be called to, to behold the manner of love that thou hast bestowed upon us in calling us thy children. And we thank thee for the opportunity that we have this evening to gather as thy children around thy word and consider the example of thy prophet Isaiah and his counsel left on record for our learning. A man of sign, who searching what and what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in him did signify, knew of the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yahweh which made him of quick understanding to judge after, not after the sight of his eyes nor the hearing of his ears, but with righteous judgment. And so we pray for the day when the greater than Isaiah, the man of Sion, even Christ will be revealed in this earth to fulfill these words in establishing a righteous kingdom and a reign on this earth to thy glory and honour. So we pray for our brothers and sisters who struggle with sickness and are poor of health, Please remember them for good in their time of need. For those who are absent from us, whatsoever their reasons may be, we pray that they may be returned to us again, and be according to thy will. So we pray for thy blessing on these activities this evening, the reading of thy word, 
and as our brother Graham leads us in the consideration of thy servant Isaiah. May we each be inspired to be encouraged to earnestly contend to the faith that we have been delivered. And now unto thee who are able to keep us from falling, and present us before thee faultless with exceeding joy, be glory, honour and majesty, both now and forever, according to thy will, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As we have said, the tonight's subject is the counsel of a prophet, and to lead us in a reading as a basis for that consideration, our brother Rodney is to read Isaiah 37. Reading, from, reading together from the Word of God, Isaiah chapter 37. And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of Yahweh. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the scribe and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth, unto Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble, and of rebuke, and of blasphemy. For the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. It may be Yahweh thy Elohim will hear the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent, to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which Yahweh thy Elohim hath heard. Wherefore lift up thy prayer for the remnant that is left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say unto your master, Thus saith Yahweh, Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumour, and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword of his own hand. So Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish. And he heard say concerning Turkana, the king of Ethiopia, he has come forth to make war with thee. And when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, <clears throat> Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands by destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? Had the gods of the nations delivered them which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan, Haran, Respa, and the children of Eda, Eden, which were in Telassa? Where is the king of Hamath, and the king of Arphad, and the king of the city of Sephavim? Hena and Iva. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up unto the house of Yahweh and spread it before Yahweh. And Hezekiah prayed unto the Yahweh, saying, O Yahweh of armies, God of Israel, thou dwellest between the cherubims, 
Thou art the God, even thou alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Incline thine ear, O Yahweh, and hear. Open thine eyes, O Yahweh, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which has sent to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Yahweh, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their countries, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Yahweh, our Elohim, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art Yahweh, even thou only. And Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent unto Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith Yahweh Elohim of Israel, Whereas thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word which Yahweh hath spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee, and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem have shaken her head at thee, who now has reproached and blasphemed, and against whom hast thou lifted up thy voice, and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel. By thy servants hast thou reproached Yahweh, and hast cast, and hast said, By the multitude of my chariots I am come up to the height of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon, and I will cut down the tall, tall cedars thereof, and the choice fir trees thereof, and I will enter into the height of his border, and the forest of his Carmel. I have digged and drunk water, and with the sole of my feet have I dried up all the rivers of the besieged places. Hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it, and of ancient times that I have formed it? Now have I brought it to pass, that thou shouldest be to lay waste, defence cities into ruinous heaps. Therefore their inhabitants were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field, and as the green herb, as the grass on the housetops, and as corn blasted before it be grown up. But I know thy abode, and thy going out, and thy coming in, and thy rage against me, because thy rage against me and thy tumult I will, is come up into mine ears. Therefore I will put my hook in thy nose, and my bridle in thy lips, and I will turn thee back by the way which thou comest. <clears throat> and this shall be a sign unto thee, ye shall eat this year with a, such as groweth of itself, and the second year that which springeth of the same. And in the third year sow ye, and reap, and plant vineyards, and eat the fruit thereof. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward, and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of Yahweh of armies, shall do this. Therefore thus saith Yahweh concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, or cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come into this city, saith Yahweh. For I will defend this city, to save it for mine own sake, and for my servant David's sake. For the angel of Yahweh went forth. Then the, angel of the, then the angel of Yahweh went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt in Nineveh. And it came to pass, as he was worshipping in the house of Nishrok his god, that Adram, Melech, and Shariza his sons smote him with the sword, and they escaped 
into the land of Armenia, and Esther Hayden, his son, reigned in his stead. So thank you, Brother Rodney, for that reading. And we now invite our Brother Graham Shug to lead us in consideration of Isaiah the prophet. Thanks, Brother Chairman, and good evening, brothers and sisters and young people. Um, I apologise for my voice tonight. It's a little bit hoarse, well, more hoarse than normal. Um, I had a bit of a flowy thing the last few days, so apologies for that. Hopefully I'll get through and you'll get through hearing it. Um, we come to our last in our series. Um, there's obviously other things we could look at in the life of Isaiah, but we've just picked out um, the key issues. And here we come to this amazing year, BC 701, and so much of the book pivoted around this point because it's the 14th year of Hezekiah's soul reign and it's the most traumatic year of his life. Um, it, it, it's quite a remarkable thing. And I just want to try to help you see where everything fits in together. Um, because unfortunately with the chronology of these kings, it's a little bit tricky. But when we see what's actually happening at what times, it just makes the record live. So please bear with me. We know that Hezekiah came to the throne in the third year of Hoshea, BC 728. We're told that in 2 Kings 18. We also know that six years later, the Assyrians take the ten northern tribes captive in the ninth year of Hoshea, the sixth year of Hezekiah, BC 722. Then we know that the Assyrians invade Judah and besiege Jerusalem in the 14th year of Hezekiah in BC 701. Anyone good at maths? What you immediately see is that BC 701 is 27 years after the commencement of his reign, not 14. Now, when we understand, however, that the period of these kings are bound not just by their literal soul reign, but also by their co-regencies, we can actually work out what's going on. This year, the 14th year of his reign in BC 701 must be the 14th year of his soul reign. He's 39. In BC 715, Ahaz died. So Hezekiah had been reigning for some time as a co-regent, which is why the destruction of the ten tribes is recorded as being in his sixth year. It's his sixth year of his co-regency. But his soul reign started in BC 715 when Ahaz died and he was aged 25. He then reigns for 29 years. This is important in this section of the scriptures. 14 years before BC 701 and then 15 years after BC 701 because, of course, that was the additional period of life that Hezekiah had been given by Yahweh. This is when he opens and cleanses the temple and holds the Passover in his first year of his soul reign. And then ultimately he dies in BC 606, age 54, 15 years later. So I hope that explains quite, quite a complex time of the kings. Uh, and the king, all of the kings during this period of time, including Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz and Manasseh, all had co-regencies. Um, if you're interested, I've done quite a bit of work on this and you can have my little charts and things which help explain it. Um, it took me 20 years to work it out. So anyway, it's, it was very enjoyable because I love that history stuff. Well, it's this period of time now when three things are happening, which is making Hezekiah's life very difficult. The reason why we had that opening hymn, I actually love that hymn. I know it can come across as a little bit sad or even depressing, but it's such a magnificent hymn because it speaks of even when things are going badly, when, when we're feeling down, it's at those times we can actually rise above in the strength of God. 
when we look forward to his purpose. This was a horrific time for Hezekiah. But with Isaiah, the prophet, by his side, they were able to lift each other up. And I hope that by the end of tonight we'll see the wonderful counts of the prophet and how we can support each other and strengthen each other through troublesome, trying times. Because this is the year that Sennacherib comes up against the fortress cities of Judah. Just come back into chapter 36 of Isaiah. Obviously, we're not going to be able to cover all of this. You know, you really need about six classes to cover this period of section really properly. But we're just going to touch base with a few of these key concepts. And Isaiah 36 verse 1, Now it came to pass in the 14th year, please note that's his 14th of his sole reign, BC 701, that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defence cities of Judah and took them. So at this moment, everything's going bad. It, it, it's a pretty sad situation of things. Sennacherib, on his prism, writes this, As for Hezekiah the Judahite, who did not submit to my yoke, 46 of his strong-walled cities, as well as the small towns in their area, which were without number, by levelling with battering rams and bringing up siege engines and by attacking and storming on foot, by mines, tunnels and breaches, I besieged and took them. I don't know whether you noticed in that reading we had tonight when Sennacherib um, is, is, you know, when Yahweh is answering Sennacherib's uh, message and his letter which he wrote to, uh, wrote to Hezekiah, over and over, Sennacherib is boasting of himself. The multitude of my chariots, and I come up. I'll cut down the tall silver. I'll enter the height of this border. I've dug and drunk. My feet have I dried. And it's this boastfulness which comes out. These kings of Syria, Syria were just absolutely amazing in, in their um, egotism. But it was a trying time for Judah. And Micah in chapter 1, of course, goes through and lists this route that Sennacherib's main army took. And we're not going to look at that, but it's wonderful in your poetry how he talks about the descending army. So that comes closer and closer and closer to Jerusalem. And Micah, it's, it's just this growing sense of dread. And even his own hometown of Morisheth Gath is going to be destroyed. It's quite a dramatic chapter and he uses uh, a lot of poetic ver verse. And he, he, he talks about things like tell it not in Gath. And Gath means tell. It sounds like the Hebrew word for tell. It's as if he's saying tell it not in tell town. You roll in dust in the house of dust. And he goes through and he makes all these poetic um, allusions to the names of these towns. As he talks about the Assyrian host coming closer and closer and closer and closer, destroying all these amazing fortress cities that Judah had trusted in to come and besiege Jerusalem itself. But there's other things that are happening. This is the very period of time when Hezekiah falls sick. So the very moment his nation needs him, he's out of the picture. Now imagine what this is doing with Isaiah. Isaiah sees what's going on. He's given the prophecies of Assyria coming down. He knows the trauma that's going to be experienced by his people. And now their leader is struck down. He can't get out of his bed. He's, he, he can't even get out of his house. He can't go and worship. He can't lead. All sorts of things happen as a result of that. Now, by comparing the records in Kings and Isaiah, we can show that this is the exact time. In Isaiah 38, it says, Thus saith Yahweh, I will add to thy days 15 years. Well, we know that he's had his soul reign of 29 years, and this is the 14th year of his soul reign. So this is the year he's sick, and there's 15 to go. He doesn't know that yet. But in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, 15 years before the end of his reign, Sennacherib came up. So we know this is the year. The year that all these things are happening, all this trial, all this tribulation, and he struck sick. And I don't know whether Paul had this in mind, but it's really interesting when he talks about the Lord Jesus Christ, the connection back to Isaiah. Romans 5, we know it. Without strength, in due time, when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died and God commended his love that he saved us from wrath 
because we've been saved by his life. Now, you just look at that comparison. Isaiah says there was not strength to bring forth. In those days was Hezekiah sick. In love to my soul, God delivered it. Sennacherib's rage was there, but I'll turn thee back, says Yahweh, and I'll deliver thee and this city. And in an amazing type, Hezekiah's saving from death is connected with the saving of his people in exactly the same way that the Lord Jesus Christ, through his death and being saved out of it, he saved us. And it's an amazing thing. But what was the response of the people? Well, you see, when you don't, when your key leader's gone, then unfortunately, instability creeps in. I don't have time to go through all the passages of Kings and, and, and Isaiah, but it's very, very clear that a man named Shebda took control of the government. He was the one who was very busy hewing out a big sepulchre for himself. We'll see that in a moment. At the very time he should have been trying to support the, the people and to lead them because Hezekiah was sick. He, he, he seems to be the one of the rulers who tried to flee down to Egypt because he couldn't uh, handle the pressure. He, I believe, was the one who in Hezekiah's name submitted to the king of Assyria while, was, while Hezekiah was sick. It was, a, it was a terrible time. And Isaiah's seeing this and his heart's bleeding for the king. It's bleeding for the people. Now, how did the people respond? I mean, just come back to Isaiah 22. We know this chapter probably. But in Isaiah 22, Isaiah talks about what the people's reaction was to all of this. What was the response? The king's sick, the Assyrians in the land, all of these fortress prince cities are being destroyed, and the governments are shambles. What's the people's response to it all? And, and here it is in Isaiah 22. The people observed the Assyrians coming from their rooftops. He says here in verse 1, the burden of the valley of vision. This is the final of the burdens, which he now speaks against Jerusalem. How is the people going to respond to this situation? What aileth thee now that thou art wholly gone up to the housetops? They went out and they saw the Assyrians surrounding the cities. They saw the burning out in the countryside. They, th th those plumes of smoke from the destruction of those fortresses would have been seen from all around. They saw it. And what was their response? Well, there was a few different ones, wasn't there? Verses 2 to 7, they were going to flee to Egypt. Uh, it's, it, Isaiah actually expounds on this in, in chapter 31. It's the rulers in verse 3, see? Not, not Hezekiah. Hezekiah is sick. This is Shebna and his crew who just couldn't hack it. And so they're trying to get out of the city. Um, Isaiah 31 talks about, oh no, here actually in verse 3, they are bound by the arches. It seems as like they couldn't get out because the arches prevented them from leaving. But that was the response of the leaders as they tried to flee down to Egypt. Some trusted in their own strength, verses 8 to 11. You can see here, he discovered in verse 8, the covering of Judah. That is, look in that day to the armour of the house of the forest. You've seen the breach of the city of David. There are many. You gather together the waters of the lower pool. That's interesting, isn't it? We know that Hezekiah began a work which he couldn't complete straight away, but which he went back to complete when he was well, of bringing the waters through the lower pool. Now, the people knew that work and some of them boasted in that. They boasted in their works, in their own strength, in solving their own problems. And, th and that was a tragedy because that was not the way that Hezekiah approached it. You've numbered the houses of Jerusalem. That's always a danger. And the houses have you broken down to fortify the wall. And they did that. They, they built that wall in such a haphazard fashion. For those of you who have been in Jerusalem and seen it, I know some of you have, you, you, you can picture it, can't you? How it was just tossed together with all these bits and pieces of stone and rock and it was a real mishmash of the wall which they put together. You have made a ditch between the two walls for the water of the old pool, but you have not looked unto the maker. Now we know Hezekiah did, but maybe in his sickness he began to doubt. 
And the people didn't have that sort of leadership. And so they thought that they were doing this in their own strength. Well, other people, they just gave up and partied. See in verse 12, In that day did Yahweh of armies call to weeping and to mourning, to baldness and to girding with sackcloth, and behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen, killing sheep, eating flesh, drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Well, that's a great way to solve problems, isn't it? That's what our modern society does, right? Life is too difficult, it's too complicated, it's too challenging. And so what do they do? Well, you inebriate yourself to forget it. You take recreational drugs or you go and fill your life with entertainment or with sport or whatever it happens to be because real life's too hard. And this is what these people did. They gave up, they party. Well, we might as well live it up. We're going to be dead tomorrow. And then, of course, like we mentioned, Shebna, well, he tries to build up his own name, doesn't he? Verse 15. Thus saith Adonai Yahweh host, go and get thee to this treasure. It, it, it actually means a steward. He, he's the one who took the stewardship of the kingship when Hezekiah was sick. You're the steward. You're the one who, in the king's absence, while he's crook, you're supposed to be looking after this, this city, these people. What have you here, says the Isaiah to, the, to this man? And whom hast thou here, that thou hewest out from this rock, a sepulchre here? Where's your kingly line? The pro, Isaiah, the prophet's asking him. How, how are you going about making a name for yourself? How, how can you do this at a time your nation needs you and your king is sick? And he tried to build up a monument to himself in self-righteousness, not believing that God would let this happen to his people. But he was going to allow them to be carried away captive if the people didn't respond to him, if they didn't hearken to Isaiah's message. And Isaiah challenges him. And, and we do have to make sure we challenge those situations where either within or without the ecclesia, People are trying to set themselves up in their own strength, boasting in their own power. And then finally, Hezekiah, the true servant, trusts in Yahweh, comes to the high priest. It's just an interesting passage here in verse 20. came to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. Now, in the Hebrew, it actually reads like this. I'll call my servant too like him, the son of Hilkiah. Now, who was the servant in the day of Isaiah? Well, you know, in one sense, it was Isaiah himself. We know, of course, it was Israel as a national servant. But we've already seen, brothers and sisters, that Hezekiah was the servant of Yahweh. And here's Hezekiah being called too like him, the son of Hilkiah. And that king is going to be clothed with his robe. He's been sick. He's been laid low. But Yahweh's going to save him. He's going to raise him out of that sickbed. And he's going to strengthen him for the purpose. The word strengthen there in verse 21 is the cognate word of Hezekiah. Strengthen of Yahweh. Hezak. I'll Hezekiah him with his girdle. And I'll commit thy government into his hand. He'll be a father to the inhabitants of the nation of Jerusalem. And it talks about how the people leaned upon Hezekiah because he had faith in Yahweh and didn't give up. And when, when Rabshakeh came to talk to them at that wall, none of the people opened their mouths, not uttered a word because they trusted in Hezekiah who said, don't say anything. They leaned on the king. And the key of the house of David will lay upon his shoulder so that he shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. And I'll fasten him as a tent peg in a sure place, a true holy place as it means. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. We know ultimately, of course, this is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. But in the days of Isaiah, it was the hope of the nation that Isaiah would be healed. Now come over to Isaiah 38. Now put yourself in Isaiah's shoes. You remember this is the little fella who would have sat on Isaiah's knee. 
This little boy Hezekiah, this promised seed of this virgin he was going to conceive. And Isaiah worked with that little boy tirelessly to prepare him for the kingship so that he would survive his co-regency with that awful man, Ahaz. And when Ahaz died, Hezekiah was prepared to take the throne and go to work. Isaiah did that and he spent so much time and energy. They would have become firm friends. And Hezekiah would have trusted Isaiah and turned to him for guidance. And look at what Yahweh asks the prophet to do. Isaiah 38 verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. This wasn't just a flu. This was life-threatening. He did not believe he was going to survive this. Uh, Probably with some form of leprosy. But we're not exactly sure what the disease was. But it was a sickness which was to death. And Isaiah is sent by Yahweh. And Isaiah, when when he heard the word of Yahweh coming to him to go to the king, he was hoping, oh, there'll be some good news. I'll be able to go to my friend and I'll be able to tell him, don't worry, Yahweh's on your side. He's going to save the city. He's going to save the order. It's all going to be fine. But the message came to him, thus saith Yahweh, set your house in order. You're a dead man. Dear me, can you imagine what that did to that prophet? All he wanted to do was to come with a message of hope, of encouragement, supportiveness, strengthening him in his time of need. And Yahweh sends him a message, you're a dead man. That's what it literally means in the Hebrew. Can you picture the prophet trudging up to the king's house? And he has to stand before him and say, I'm sorry, my son. You know I love you. You know I'd do anything for you, but you're going to die. Nothing you can do. What do you do when you get that message? I've never had terminal illness. I don't know what it's like. I know some of our brothers and sisters who have, though. It's a pretty difficult thing to deal with. It's a very challenging thing to get your head around. It's very easy to say, oh, I trust in God. Really easy to say that. It's not so easy when you've got to confront it. And look at Hezekiah's response. He turned his face to the wall, verse 2, and he prayed. What else could he do? There was nothing. There was nothing he could do. You know what, brothers and sisters, we need to realise that there is nothing that we can do to escape death. Nothing. The only thing we can do is pray to our Father for redemption and salvation. We cannot save ourselves. He's the only one who can do it. And he's locked up in his house. Sennacherib says, like a caged bird. Uncle Bert told me a very humorous thing that he sort of always pictures it. It was, it was like Hezekiah just chattering all the time to his people, reassuring him, re- strengthening them. And, and, he, and Sennacherib got sick of hearing about Hezekiah strengthening and helping the people. And it's like he wanted to just shut him up. I don't know, Uncle Bert, exactly if that's exactly what he was saying, but certainly... He wanted to quieten Hezekiah. He wanted to stop the people from trusting in him. And so he closed him up in his, his, in his royal city. I added to the former tribute. I laid upon him the surrender of their land and imposts. Gifts for my majesty. As for Hezekiah, this terrifying splendor of my majesty overcame him. To pay tribute and to accept service, he dispatched his messages. And this is that period of time when he's sick and Shebna's going and working behind his back. And now he's told he's going to die. He's a dead man. This terminal illness it seems to be associated with um, leprosy because in verse 21 of chapter 38 of Isaiah, when Isaiah was going to heal him, he says, let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the boil. And that word is the same word used in Leviticus 13, verses 18 to 20, of this leprosy. 
which is the Israelites unfortunately brought with them out of Egypt. Um, it suggested that it's a form of elephantitis. Whatever the case, it was something that was so devastating, there was nothing else he could do. He couldn't leave his house. You see in verse 11 of chapter 38, I said, I shall not see Yahweh. Even Yahweh in the land of the living, I shall behold man no more. He couldn't leave his house. He, he couldn't get out to the temple. He couldn't go and worship. He couldn't leave the people. And the worst tragedy for him was that he was unmarried and he was childless. There was no children left. My age is departed, verse 12. It's removed from me like a shepherd's tent. I'm cut off like a weaver. There was nothing that was left for him. I said, in the cutting off of my days, I'll go to the gates of the grave and deprive the residue of my years. And he had no children. What an amazing thing. Well, brothers and sisters, we don't have time to go through all of these, but if you compare Isaiah 38 with Isaiah 53, you can see what an amazing type of the Lord Jesus Christ Hezekiah was. He was sick unto death. He was told to set his house in order for he's going to die. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ was stricken of God, who was going to declare his generation? He had no children, so it seemed. Hezekiah could turn to Yahweh and say in verse 3 of chapter 38, Remember now, O Yahweh, I beseech thee, I have walked before thee in truth with an undivided heart and done that which is good in thy sight. And Yahweh did not rebuke him for that. Yahweh did not say, No, you're wrong, Hezekiah. The fact is he'd done that. And he did trust in him with his whole heart. It was undivided. And Hezekiah wept sore. And the Lord Jesus Christ, as we know, had done no violence. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. He was a man of sorrows. And you could just compare the two. But what's fascinating is some of the language he uses. Just Let's come back to verse 10 again. I said in the cutting off my days, it means the noontide. He didn't know this yet, but he was in the middle of the rest of his life, right? He'd reigned 14 years. He was going to have another 15 years. He was in the noontide. He was right in the middle. And he feels like he's got so much more to give, so much more to do for the nation, so much more he can do to serve his God. And yet he's cut off right midstream. I'm going to go to the gates of the grave and this cutting off, this time of having things pulled out from under his feet, he says it's like I'm deprived of the residue of my years. Now that word residue, brothers and sisters, is the word for the guy rope of a tent. It was used for when you wanted to undo a tent. You'd release the guy rope and you'd fold it up. That's the word in the Hebrew. I'm deprived of the guy rope of the tent. That thing that holds it together is gone. And then he says in verse 12, my generation is departed. That word literally means to pull up tent pegs. Not only is the guy rope gone, but the tent pegs are being pulled up and it's removed. That word removed in the Hebrew means to roll up a tent. So they've taken off the guy rope, they've pulled up the tent pegs and they're rolling up the tent. See, I wanted to be a shepherd. I wanted to lead my people, but my tent's gone. It, it, it's been pulled apart. And it's as if he sees himself as this little hanging thread. I, I have cut off like a weaver my life. And the weaver would come to those little hanging threads and they'd cut them off. I'm just like this little thread, he says. And he pleads with Yahweh to hearken to him. He mourns as a dove. He's oppressed in the bitterness of his soul. And he pleads with the Father to make him to live so that peace can come to the people. Now, the amazing thing is, is that God heard that. We don't know how long it was from the time that Isaiah walked in there and said, you're a dead man and just strode back out. And how long it took for the message to come back. But we know it can't be too long. Just come back to 2 Kings chapter 20. You imagine Isaiah's feelings as he left that room, having left nothing but heartache for his, for his king. 
for that young man that he loved keenly like his own son. And he had to leave him behind, turn his back on him. And just look how Yahweh comes back hearing Hezekiah's prayer, seeing the depth of his despair and the reasons for that, not for himself, but for his people and for God's righteousness. And in chapter 20 of 2 Kings verse 4, and it came to pass, a for Isaiah was gone out into the middle court that the word of Yahweh came to him. Now that's a poor translation. It's actually the middle part of the city. So He's left the, the, the house of the king. He's walked down that, that passageway, that, 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 that big walkway that headed down towards the pool of Siloam. And he's only halfway down. So he hasn't even got far. I, I don't know how long it'll take, 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes. And suddenly the word of Yahweh has come back to him. Now stop, stop Isaiah. Hezekiah's prayed and, and I've seen the, the urgency and, and, and the desire of his heart. Now I want you to go back. And you can imagine the skip in his, in his step, can't you? Wow, I thought that was it. I thought it was finished. And now there's hope and he's jumping up and he's running back up the steps up to the king's house. And Yahweh says to him in verse 5, Turn again, tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people. You see, Hezekiah is this outstanding type of Christ, the captain of our salvation. And he was going to, typically die for his people that they might be saved and a staggering thing and he says go and tell him that I Yahweh the God of David thy father I know that Hezekiah Ahaz was never your father David's your father there's an amazing theme of that that runs through the life of Hezekiah I've heard your prayer I've seen your tears. Behold, I'll heal thee on the third day. And just as the Lord Jesus Christ, the third day, rose out of the tomb, Isaiah would bring about, on behalf of Yahweh, the saving of Hezekiah, the salvation of Yah, Isaiah, would come to the king. And he can imagine the absolute joy in which he turned back up to that, up to that king's house to his sickbed. He was the covenant victim through which he and his people would be saved. It's quite amazing, isn't it? In Isaiah 22 verse 14, Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till ye die. But then in Isaiah 33 it says, And the inhabitant shall not say, I am sick, the people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. And there's this huge change that happens between these two passages. Hezekiah, you're sick, you're dying, and your nation's going to die. And then suddenly, no. No, no you're not going to say, I'm sick. The people that dwell therein shall be forgiven. What brings about that change? And it's this. In the early part of Isaiah chapter 33, Isaiah says this is how that change happens. This is how you can go from dying, mortal, sinful state to being a state of healed and forgiven. Yahweh is exalted. That's what you do. Exalt him. And that's exactly what Hezekiah did. And that's what Isaiah, I'm sure, did, encouraged him to do as well. For he dwelleth on high, he is filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability and strength of salvation. The fear of Yahweh is his treasure. And because Hezekiah understood that, Yahweh was able to forgive him. What an amazing thing that is. And in verse 6 of 2 Kings chapter 20, Yahweh says to him through the prophet, I will add to thy days 15 years. And I'll deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. I'll defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. So he's going to be, have 15 years added to him. And it was that that allowed him to marry his wife, Hephzibah, and for them to have children to continue the godly seed. What a marvellous privilege this was. And so in verse 7, Isaiah said, take a lump of figs. They took it. I laid it on the boil, that leprous lump, and he recovered. And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, unto Isaiah, What shall be the sign that Yahweh will heal me? 
He believed, but he just needed reassurance. It's just like us, brothers and sisters. Lord, I believe, help thy mind, unbelief. And he just wanted a sign, just to be certain that he would go forward in the strength of Yahweh. And Isaiah says to him, verse 9, This sign shalt thou have from Yahweh, that the thing Yahweh will do for thee, that he has spoken, will happen. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or back 10 degrees? And Hezekiah answered, It's a light thing for a shadow to go down 10 degrees, but let the shadow return backward. And Isaiah the prophet cried unto Yahweh, and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward, by which he'd gone down in the sundial of Ahaz. Of Ahaz. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I find this quite interesting. The word here for degrees in the 10 degrees is maloth. It means a journey to a higher place or steps. Now, what the archaeologists are now suggesting is that there was an actual literal staircase in which the shadow moved down the steps as the sun moved across the sky. And it was possibly one between the royal palace and the higher level of the temple area. In fact, the same word is used of the temple area in 2 Kings 9 verse 13 of the stairs there. So it seems probable to me anyway, I'll leave it up to you what you think about it, that at the top of the stairs there was a pillar that cast the shadow. And as the sun went across the sky, the shadow lengthened on the steps. Who knows? An hour a step, half an hour a step, who knows? But whatever it happened to be, the people could see the shadow on the steps and see what time it was. Now, while God is more than capable, please don't get me wrong, brothers, I have no question about this. God is more than capable of reversing the revolution of the earth to reverse time. He's quite capable of doing that. I don't think that's what's happened. I know that there's lots of arguments about, oh, you know, God reversing, the, there's missing time and all sorts of things. I, yeah, I'm very sceptical of that, brothers and sisters, to be honest. The reasons is this. It is very clear that the phenomenon was only seen on the sundial of Ahaz. Now, if God reversed the turning of the earth, that would have been seen everywhere. But it wasn't. It specifically says it only was seen on the sundial of Ahaz. The Babylonians actually said that the wonder was done in the land and they heard about it later. It didn't happen in Babylon. They didn't see it. They heard about it later and they went to find out about it. Now, there's a remarkable little situation in the situation where um, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, is heading up to Damascus. He's struck down by this glorious shining light emanating out of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Acts 26 verse 13 says that the glory of Yahweh shone greater than the light of the sun. I believe that's what happened. I believe that Yahweh sent the angel of the presence to shine as a glorious light, which shone above the glory of the sun, and it moved that shadow back. It was a sign, brothers and sisters, of Yahweh's presence in the nation to save them and redeem them. What was the result of it? The shadow went back 10 steps by the very ascent that he could enter God's house. And after three days, he would go and offer thanks. And Isaiah 33 verse 17 says, Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. And the people were finally going to see him. Hezekiah promised to sing songs on the stringed instruments all of his life as a result of that if he was healed. And he subsequently wrote 15, well, he collated 15 songs of the steps, songs of degrees, 15, one for every year. Ten of them were written by himself, 10 steps. He wanted to show Yahweh that he never forgot. And so he went back to work. Come over to 2 Chronicles 32. Second of Chronicles 32, we'll pick up the record here in verse 1. Same context, same time frame. 
After these things and the establishment thereof, Sennacherib king of Assyria came and entered into Judah and encamped against the fenced cities and thought to win them for himself. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come, that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem, he took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the foundations uh, of the fountains that were without the city and they did help him. They closed up the Gihon Spring, they built a big tower over it they built the surrounding wall to protect the people who had flooded down from the north, um, from, from the uh, countryside, and they dug this tunnel. You, I don't want to go into details because you know the story of it, but it was quite a staggering achievement. Um, some of us have had the privilege to walk through there. You know, there's this inscription that they found, isn't there? The tunnel. Here's the story of the tunnel. While the axes were against each other and while three cubits were left to cut, the voice of the man called to his counterpart, for there was a crack in the rock on the right. And on the day of the tunnel being finished, the stone cutters struck each man toward his counterpart, axe against axe, and flow, flowed water from the source to the pool for 1,200 cubits. And I'm not sure exactly because it's a little bit of trouble reading the inscription. Probably 100 cubits was the height over the heads of the stone cutters. It's a big, big, uh, big tunnel. And the waters flowed. Amazing thing. But they didn't just do that. It wasn't just about the water supply, although that was true. It was about teaching the people what that meant. The waters of Shiloh that go softly. And all of that principle was about trusting in Yahweh to bring peace. And he taught the people the value of the water of God's word not just about the literal waters that came in. Verse 5, he strengthened himself. It's that word kazak. It's, it's the related word to his own name, Hezekiah himself. And built up the wall that was broken and raised up to the towers and another without and repaired Milo. Now, Milo means the filling. So, so it was, he, he built up a, another wall. And of course, the hillside goes like this. So to strengthen the wall, he backfilled it. That's the Milo. And so it strengthened the city wall. So he, he built extra supports to protect the city. And he gathered darts and shields in abundance. He set captains of war over the people. He gathered them together to him in the street of the gate of the city. And he spake comfortably to them, saying, Be strong, Kazak, and courageous. Be not afraid nor displayed for the, displayed for the king of Assyria nor for all the multitudes that with him, for there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is Yahweh our God to help us. You see, he wasn't like those other rulers and those other people who thought that they were solving their own problems and building their own, own so solutions to the problem. He trusted in Yahweh. That was the influence of Isaiah. And he got to work. Well, come back to Isaiah chapter 36. Sennacherib, of course, sends the Rabshakeh, doesn't he? And the Rabshakeh is a title. It means the field commander. Literally in the Hebrew, it means the chief cupbearer or the chief of staff. And he comes and he stands in exactly the same spot where Isaiah came to bring Yahweh's sign to Ahaz about a virgin that would conceive. At the very place where the Redeemer was pr pronounced, redemption was going to come if they trusted in Yahweh and not in the serpent's speech. And we don't have time to go through all this, so I'm going to rush through it pretty quickly. He starts off by saying, Hezekiah is a vain hypocrite. Can't trust him. He's a two-faced play actor. Who are you going to place your trust on? You just look at the way we've handled things. You can't trust Egypt. And how can you trust God when his oldest have been removed? Now, of course, that was a real misnomer because, of course, Hezekiah didn't remove Yahweh's altar. He removed Ahaz's altar that he'd put in its place. But it's amazing how the serpent could twist words. You can't even find 2,000 cavalry soldiers, he says to him. You can't find enough to put on the horses. I'll give you the horses, but you can't find enough riders for them. You couldn't win against one of my men. And you know what? God, your God, is the very one who sent me to you. That's amazing because Isaiah had actually prophesied that in Isaiah 8 and 10. 
that the Assyrians were Yahweh's arm. They were the ones who were going to work on behalf of Yahweh. He's actually quoting the prophet's own words back to the people. I wonder how he knew that. Some have suggested that he was actually a defector. He was a Jew himself. But we don't know exactly what the situation was. He certainly has his spies in the city. He knew exactly what was going on. He knew what the people were feeling like. And he used it. And he tried to turn the people against Yahweh. Now at this point, I like him, Shebna, not Shebna the steward. This is another Shebna. And Joah... They plead with Rabshakeh not to speak in Hebrew to the people. Instead, he calls out louder and he keeps going in, in the Hebrew language. Why endure the horrors of the siege? Don't let Hezekiah trick you. Don't let Hezekiah force his religion on you. If you re re surrender, I'll actually give you peace. And he quotes the words of Micah. And he says, I'll let you sit under your own vine and fig tree. It's amazing how the world can use so-called spiritual language to justify all sorts of things and thinking and behaviours. Oh, you'll enjoy change of scenery. It'll be a bit of a holiday, he says. See, religion can't save people. The other gods and nations couldn't do anything. Now, as soon as he's opened his mouth against Yahweh, he sealed his fate. That was it. Yahweh would not allow his name to be impugned. Who do you trust in? Well, Hezekiah trusted in Yahweh. And the response of the people to their king? Have a look in Isaiah 36, verse 21. They held their peace. See, this is what happens when you in peace with yourself. When you understand where you sit in the plan and purpose of God, your insignificance and yet the great privilege position, you have this very calm centre. And it doesn't matter what's going on around you. It doesn't matter what a devastation, what troubles, what concerns, what issues, what tragedies. You know that Yahweh is working with you in all things for good, even in the bad. And when you have that center and that peace, nothing can shift you. It's only when we start doubting God and we start questioning what he's doing and why did you allow that to happen to me? And it's not fair. And how come they're getting along fine and they don't have any problems? Why do I have to put up with this? And we start questioning God's involvement in our lives. We lose our centre. We lose our faith and we lose our peace. Well, here's the king in the absolute worst thing imaginable. His city is surrounded. There is nowhere else. Everything else has been destroyed and decimated. Jerusalem is all that there is left of the Jewish people. Everyone's in those walls. And yet there's complete calm, complete peace, because they trust in the word of their God, that he said, I'm going to save you and I'm going to save your city for David, my servant's sake, and they didn't doubt it. And so Yahweh did it. Let's never doubt God's hand in our life even in the bad times. Because God's work is only just beginning in certain respects with us. And what he's started in us, he's not going to let half done. He's going to finish that work and he's going to bring us into the kingdom of God. My little children, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Don't let us ever doubt it. And so although it felt like they were a woman in travail, typically that child was going to be born. They were going to be saved. Well, Hezekiah's response, when he hears all this, look in verse 1 of chapter 37. came to pass, when King Hezekiah heard it, he rent his clothes. 
He covered himself with sackcloth and he went into the house of Yahweh. That's what he did. That was his first response. That has to be our first response. And Sennacherib sends a letter. And Hezekiah takes this letter and he opens it up. Just come over to Second of Chronicles chapter 32. Because as we finish this little consideration tonight, and we're only scratching the surface, I'd really encourage you to have a deeper look in the life of Isaiah and Hezekiah at this time. Look at how this beautifully comes together. After he writes this letter, Hezekiah opens it up, he lays it before him, and just look here in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 18. Then they cried with a loud voice in the Jew speech out of the people of Jerusalem that were on the wall to frighten them. Can you imagine these hordes of Assyrians? They were the most despicable of people. You know that they'd, they'd take the heads of the, 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 the people who lived in the city that they conquered. They'd cut them off and they'd stack them in pyramids in front of the gates. They were cruel people. It would have been terrifying to hear these savages crying out, troubling them that they would take the city. Verse 19, And they spake against the God of Jerusalem, as against the gods of the people of the earth, which were the work of the hands of man, and it could have shaken them their cause to, to, to their knees. But look at this, verse 20. For this cause, Hezekiah the king, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, prayed and cried to heaven. Just look at it. At the very time when Hezekiah needed support, there was the prophet. Right next to him. Kneeling down beside him. Because he was one with his king as they were one with his people. It's a wonderful, wonderful example of true friendship and spiritual thinking. You know, our friends, our good friends, aren't the ones who enable us to do our own things, our own pleasures, to make us feel good about ourselves. Our best friends are the ones who get down in the trenches and kneel with us in prayer to the Father. They're the good friends. And sometimes tough words need to be spent. I hope no one comes to tell me I'm a dead man, but you know, sometimes you've got to speak tough words. And Isaiah was prepared to do that. But he was also prepared to get on his knees, to support his king. And together, they pray, prayed unto Yahweh. And Yahweh heard their plea. Assyria was as good as defeated. And Isaiah delivers this wonderful answer. And he just we don't have time to go through it all, but just look at it. Isaiah delivers God's answer in the form of an oracle against Sennacherib. He talks about Sennacherib's boasting and blasphemy, and he condemns it. Sennacherib's power did come from God, yes, and now God's going to take it away. God gives, God takes away. You want to boast in yourself, well then you're finished. Hezekiah is given a sign and a promise that Sennacherib will not besiege or invade the city of Jerusalem. He wasn't going to get that far. And the reality was, is that Sennacherib was still besieging Laish. He wasn't going to end up here. It was only Rabshakeh in the, in the initial troops. Sennacherib wouldn't even get the chance. And Yahweh gives a sign that his words will be accomplished. There was going to be a wonderful blessing in the crops of the field. Don't worry about your food, he says. Even though the land's been decimated, destroyed, you're not even going to have to sow. The first year is going to pop up and grow of its own accord. You know what? Not only that, the second year it's going to grow by itself as well. And then the third year, you can go back to labouring and to sowing your crops. What a magnificent thing that he would care for his people. It's a great type of the jubilee. We don't have time to go into it. But an amazing thing, isn't it? As Yahweh, through Isaiah the prophet, gives them this wonderful blessing. And the outcome? Well, let's just come back to Isaiah 37. We're almost finished. What an amazing outcome this is.
and a great type of the latter-day Assyrian. When the Russian host comes into the land, Yahweh puts a hook in their nose and turns them back. It's a wonderful thing, this message. I, you just note in verse 21 of Isaiah 37, by the way, then Isaiah the son of Amos sent unto Hezekiah. I wonder if he sent Shear Jashub, his son. Do you remember Shear Jashub? His name means a remnant shall return. I wonder if Yahweh got Isaiah to send Shear Jashub to give this message. Because in verse 31, look at what the prophet says. And the remnant, and there's Shear Jashub standing there giving this message. The remnant that's escaped out of the house of Judah shall take, again take root downward and bear fruit upward, just like the crops that I've promised you. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant. And they that escape out of Mount Zion and the zeal of Yahweh's army shall do this. You've got nothing to worry about. He's not going to get here. He's not going to even besiege the city. I'm going to cut off his forces and he's going to rush off home with his tail between his leg. And that's exactly what happened, verse 36. The angel of Yahweh went forth, smote in the camp of the Assyrians, a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. It's a bit funny, isn't it, the way it reads like that? But of course, what he's saying is that the people of the city, when they got out there, saw all the dead bodies on the ground. The angel of death had passed over and there was no blood on the lintels for the Assyrians. But there was blood on the lintel for Jerusalem. Because Hezekiah had typically given his own life. And he was resurrected typically, typically, so that the people could be saved. And Sennacherib, he departed. There is no more record in, the, in, in Sennacherib's prison about Jerusalem. <laughs> he went back in abject failure and ends up many years later, BC 681, he's killed by his own sons. What an amazing thing, brothers and sisters that Isaiah could strengthen Hezekiah at this time. We won't look at that. I just want to finish one last quote in Isaiah chapter 62. Because of the extra years that Hezekiah was given, he was able to take a bride. There's some suggestions that Hepzibah was a Gentile bride. It seems entirely appropriate to me. It's all sorts of types which run through Solomon and the daughter of Pharaoh who was his true bride, uh, the Gentile bride who's joined to their king. There's marvellous types in all of that. She may have been the uh, daughter of the king of Tyre. But whatever the case, it was a wonderful blessing that Hepzibah came to Hezekiah for all his troubles and difficulties with his scars and his bruises and everything that he endured. She saw past that. She saw this wonderful man of faith, and in Isaiah 62, the prophet, rejoicing in the marriage of Hezekiah to his bride, writes these glorious words of Isaiah 62. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, and to the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation is supplied his own name, thereof as a lamp that burneth, it's so reminiscent of John the Baptist, isn't it? The voice that cries in the wilderness, called out, he couldn't hold his peace. And he was this lamp that shone, pointing to the true light. And the Gentiles, verse 2, shall see thy righteousness. All kings thy glory and all the surrounding nations heard of the victory of Hezekiah. And they came to, to praise him and to rejoice in what he'd done. All the kings shall see thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of Yahweh shall name. Thou shalt have a crown of glory, or you'll be a crown of glory in the hand of Yahweh, a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Interesting, isn't it, that John the Baptist talked about the royal majesty of the heavens being approaching in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken. It's the word to leave, left behind. Nor shall thy land be any more termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hepzibah. My delight is in her. 
And I land Beulah. Beulah means to marry. For Yahweh delighted me. And I land shall be married. And here at this wonderful marriage, there's a great type of time to come. When their king would be in the earth. When they would be united to him in this glorious wedding of the Lamb. As a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. As a bridegroom rejoiceth over a bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. And children came, didn't they? Their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, their offspring among the people, says chapter 61, verse 9. And because of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're prepared as the glorious bride. And the days of Hezekiah, it was Isaiah and the council of the prophet who got through that very troublesome trying time. And we, brothers and sisters, no matter how difficult our life is now, can strengthen each other, can lift each other up and prepare us for the times when our Lord will be in the earth. We have nothing to fear. We don't have to be worried about anything. We don't have to have any concerns. We can be at complete peace, resting in the salvation of Yahweh. Well, on your behalf, I'd very much like to thank our brother Graham Shug for his studies over the last five nights. He shared some very amazing types and wonderful lessons from Isaiah with a great deal of enthusiasm. Thanks for that, brother Graham. Now, by way of announcements, there will be no class until the 8th of May due to holidays in Glenlock. Now, there is on Wednesday, 1st of May, however, a planning meeting. I'm not exactly sure what it's about, but... Stay tuned for further details and no doubt we'll be advised when that comes. So the next class on 8th of May uh, will be led by Brother John Evans uh, to the theme, A Soft Answer Turneth Away Wrath. Chairman is Dad, Brother Lionel Dedman, um, Rita Simeon Wigsell, and the piano or pianist will be Belinda Dyer. Supper is Hannah uh, Meal and Hannah Wigsell. So... That's all the announcements, and we will close with him, him seven, and prayer. Father, once more we come into thy presence, indeed thankful that thou hast given us a privilege to gather this evening 
Consider thy love in, revealed in thy servants who give witness to thy name. Not only thy servant Isaiah and Hezekiah, but most of all in thy son. That we may have the privilege of being called out of people for thy name. To follow after their example and take refuge in shelter in thy sure hope which thou hast delivered those in the past. Thou art surely able to deliver us. So we pray for the day when thy name will be hallowed throughout all this earth, when all mankind will know of thee, even of thy ways and of thy character, abundant in mercy and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. For we know that when thy glory is revealed and glory to thee in the highest, then there will be peace and goodwill towards mankind. So may we find grace in thine eyes in that day that the glory may be revealed in us and that we may be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye when this mortal shall be put on immortality and this corruptible incorruption. And as we wait the dawning of that new day, we pray for strength to be with us in the week ahead that we may seek first thy kingdom and thy righteousness, growing in grace to reflect thee in thy character, knowing that the joy of thy kingdom will bring with it when thy glory is revealed in all of us, even the faithful of old. Yet in truth we can scarce comprehend thy glory, for our eyes have not seen, and our ears have not heard, neither have they entered into our hearts the things which thou hast prepared for all who love thy appearing. So we thank thee for this hope which we have been called to, and we thank thee also for the natural blessings provided with us, day by day, food, clothing and shelter. We acknowledge that there are indeed so many in this world that go without these things. But we take courage, knowing that when thy righteousness is given to the king, the poor and the needy, those despised, oppressed, will be cared for, as long as the sun and moon endure. We pray also for thy people, Israel, for the peace of Jerusalem, for praise waiteth for thee in Zion. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, both now and ever. We offer this our prayer according to thy will, for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.